Thanks, Babs. Um, Kate will be fine. It's funny, when I meet people outside of football, everyone calls me Kate, and then they say, oh, you know, busy, and no one knows who that is. So um, thank you very much to Helen and to FFE for the invitation today. Um, I had the fortune of falling into women's football, really, in 2004, and since then it's certainly become a massive part of my life. So as Bob said, I was the Matilda's physio um, in a very privileged position for 10 years. And after Rio, I sort of felt like probably my time in the track suit was, was coming to an end, but I really felt like I could contribute um, to the landscape of women's football um, in Australia. And, and we've worked really hard in that time to get some programs happening at the elite level. Elite level. Um, but what we know about injury prevention is, is implementation into grassroots and the underpinning programs is where we really need to kind of all work collectively to do that. So I'm going to talk to you today about how we can manage um, the injury risk in, in female footballers and, and it's a big kind of topic and I've got 30 minutes. I do talk very fast so I'm not going to cover it all today but hopefully a few things to, to consider and take home and, and work with your players um, with. What's that? Point it that way. Oh, point it that way? Okay, thank you, Ray. Um, so really, you know, as coaches, as players and administrators in, in football, we really all work together to, for a common goal, and that's to, you know, create a love of the game, create participation, create numbers, so that we can develop a really healthy um, and capable bunch of, of female footballers. And certainly, um, you know, in Australia, our participation numbers are really important, um, but we want to really keep them there and keep them enjoying it. And if you're injured, I'm sure many of you in this room have either been injured yourself or worked with injured athletes, that takes a lot of the fun away from the game, which is why a lot of them get into it in the first place and certainly what keeps a lot of them involved. So injury has um, a significant impact in terms of player development, uh, enjoyment, participation, uh, and ultimately success. Now, success might be on the Matilda stage, but success might also be in remaining physically active and doing something that they love, which is really important from a public health point of view, but also from a um, from a teenager's point of view in terms of uh, the, the female, you know, adolescent um, female that's really important in terms of, you know, mental health and, and wellbeing and all those sorts of things. So um, there's not a lot of data in terms of the impact of injury at youth level, but Alan McCall, who's a great sports scientist who worked with us at FFA for a while and is still one of the, um, the heads of research and development that works at Arsenal, I think, as well, Joe. Um, so what we know is that if you have an injury, 60% of those people will become negatively impacted in regards to their technical development. So for you largely as coaches, that certainly has implications, which is why it's not just the physio's role in terms of injury prevention, it's not just the player's self-role, it's certainly all of us collectively together because if they are injured, there is very good data to suggest that often they don't go on to reach what their subjective, um, you know, expectation is of where they might go with their career, but it certainly hampers that really important development stage through sort of childhood, through adolescence and in their early teens, uh, early 20s. So if, if, we, um, if we consider injury really lost time in playing and in training has an impairment in terms of their physical development, so how their body develops through the normal stages of, um, of adolescence, there is consequences in regards to their mental health um, and from a coaching point of view, as I said, technically constrained and there's some uh, interference in terms of your tactics. If your two key players are off the pitch and your tactics revolve around a Sam Kerr-like player, if she's not on the pitch, then as a coach, that really does impact on what you do from a day-to-day -day basis. So ultimately, we all want to keep them safe and healthy on the, on the park. Now, I'm sure many of you have heard of the you know, throw a number of eggs, see how many break at the wall. In Australia, we do not have a massive talent pool in women's football. And even more so, and you can say this very comfortably in Melbourne, AFL women's are breathing down our neck. We absolutely have to protect our players and how we do that is really important. And so making sure that as an organisation we have some recommendations and some strategies in place, not only at Elite but certainly through all our um, member feds is really, really important. And one, I'm very fortunate that when I resigned from my role as the team, FFA really saw a, a role for... Um, the injury prevention space and certainly supporting not only the women's game but the men's game as well. So we don't have the talent pool in terms of numbers that the US does or China has or our Asian counterparts, but that's what we're competing against. And 
purely because we don't have massive numbers doesn't mean you can't be successful, and we're certainly showing that. Um, and I think before when we heard about Iceland, you know, I mean, 300,000 people, if, if you protect what you've got, um, then you can certainly do some great things. So the other thing that we do know, whilst injury prevention is hard to get into a player's head, they don't, they don't really necessarily get that. It's hard. It's not an easy sell. It's certainly not an easy sell, and I've been talking about injury prevention to coaches for a long time, but it does have a very clear um, implication in terms of success. And we know that that's kind of common sense. The more available players you've got, the more likely it is that you are to do well. Well, science certainly backs that up, and there is a number of studies, and largely the UEFA group do the big studies in football and have done historically but what we know is the more players that are available that does equate into success in football terms in terms of win and loss so it is really important that we we um we consider that but as i said success doesn't necessarily have to mean definition in in trophies it can also be participation and 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 in terms of our opportunity for players to create that they can then if they choose to take that next level so really what, what is injury prevention, and, and often I use this slide because there is misconceptions, I think, about what injury prevention is. Um, you know, sleep's often talked about, the 11 plus, which I certainly know here in, in Victoria, FFA, probably the, um, the member fed of gold standard in terms to, of rolling this program out. So, but largely, um, sometimes it's, it's considered the only thing that we should consider when we talk about injury prevention. Ice baths is, is, is one thing that's often, you know, mixed in that in that space um, stretching you know prehabilitation activation whatever you like to call that on terms of field largely that's a strength um, based um, training modality um, rule changes fair play all those sorts of things that is also a part of injury prevention and load management now we're not going to talk about all those things today largely we're going to talk about what strength and what the neuromuscular training programs do and how we can implement that most effectively the reason for that is that, is this going to work if I do my laser? It's too many screens, so I won't do my laser. Um, is that the factors that contribute to injury are multifactorial. So we have intrinsic risk factors, which are things like that we can't change. Age, past history, and so forth. And then we have extra intrinsic training, um, factors as well. On top of that, we have training loads. So, um, you know, if you train minimally but then you're exposed to high training volumes then you can be at risk of injury and vice versa if you train really hard but get there really quickly then we also know that that has implications so when we talk about injury prevention we really have to consider all the variables which is why it's not a one you know one stop shop for for everything so we have to consider the variables across across the way so in regards to women's football which is largely what we're talking about obviously today it's um what, what is our biggest threat? And what we know in, in, um, in Australia is that the ACL injury is certainly our biggest threat. And it's our biggest threat because it's not the most common injury that occurs, but it is the most um, costly. And that's costly in terms of uh, missed opportunity, in terms of training, its financial cost to that player and potentially to the organisation. It's the psychological cost. And it's the long-term effect that it has on that player's health. So I'm just going to highlight three players um, that have... Um, interesting stories to tell that may resonate with some of you and I've kindly, um, Sarah's kindly in the room today. Um, but I'll start with Colette McCallum who hopefully most of you are very familiar with who's probably got the best um, left foot that we've ever produced, certainly from a dead ball situation. Uh, Colette was an unbelievable player and she had two ACLs by the time she made the national team so she was in contention for 2004 Athens and did her knee in the lead up to that. And Colette retired... Prior to, in a, in a really valid attempt to make the 2015 World Cup team, she retired um, prior to that in our, um, our pre-World Cup camp um, in Italy because her knees just weren't standing up with the rigours of what was required for international football. So, you know, Colette ended up playing 81 caps for Australia, but take those two knees out of that and that certainly could have been a lot, lot more. Sarah Walsh, who I don't need to introduce, um, who's here today. So Sarah... Um, kindly told this story to the NTC group a couple of weeks ago in Canberra, but Sarah has had three ACL injuries all by the time that she made the national team. Um, and so Sarah played 75 caps, is that correct, um, for Australia after doing those three knees um, and again retired largely due, due to knee complaints as a result of that 
first sort of ACL injury. So if you compare Sarah's career to Heather Garriock, and they grew up in very, very similar um, junior ranks and, and very, they were always sort of um, in the same rep teams growing up, Heather played 130 caps for Australia. So you can see from a technical restraint and a restraint of trade um, and opportunity that it does have a significant impact. And my third one is, is the saddest probably story of it all, and I do get quite emotional actually when I talk about Ash, um, who is a Victorian. Does anyone know Ash Brown? So I'm sure many of you know her story. So Ash grew up um, very much like Steph Catley. They were similar to Heather and Sarah, very similar stories. They were picked for all the rep teams together. They largely made the national team at the same age. Unfortunately, Ash has only ever played six games for Australia. Steph, Steph is now um, in his 60s, I think. Um, and Ash has had three ACL reconstructions as well. So it has significant implications. Um, and so we really collectively need to work together to save, to, you know, if we save one Ash, um, then, then we've certainly, you know, done our job. The sad thing about injury prevention is you won't know who you've saved and you won't, you know, you won't know, but we know historically from lots of data, uh, and it is, it is, this is not my opinion, this is data, is that injury prevention programs can you know, really reduce injuries by up to a half. So that's one in two, um, you know, so we can, we can certainly make an impact. So um, Ash never went on to play another game um, for Australia. So is it just women's football? Should we be telling kids not to play football? Um, absolutely not. And when I tell this story, I really do mean not to scare people. And certainly when we talk to players about it, it's not scaring players because the reality is that it is a significant problem in all sport uh, and what we call high risk sport. So high risk is multi-directional change of um, change of speed um, and certainly largely you know big field options. So in this country, it's soccer, um, Aussie rules, and certainly in um, in the AFLW, they're going to see um, a significant increase in in their numbers compared to their males. Um, but you're about you know, two and a half times greater risk of doing it if you play a high risk sport than if you don't, okay? So we have large numbers. There's a really recent report that came out and this was based on um, numbers of reconstructions in Australia. So that obviously is not all the ACLs that, that occur, but what we capture at the moment is is how many then go on to reconstruction. In Australia, we actually have, it's, it's rising. So if you look at that data there, the green, which is down the bottom, is females. So males is high, but that's largely due to exposure and more males participate in sport than females. So um, so it's on the rise. And if you look at that, compared to 2000, um, the average per 100,000 in the population was about 50 in total, and now it's sort of over 60. And certainly from females, it was up around sort of 38, I think, in 2000, and now we're up sort of over 40. So it is certainly on the rise. If we look at our statistics compared to across the ditch, is there any Kiwis in here? Their numbers are significantly less. So our numbers are around sort of um, our total is up around sort of 80 uh, reconstructions per 100,000. New Zealand has sort of 35. Uh, the Norwegians are in the 30s as well as are Sweden. And there are reasons for that. Um, and I'll explain that in a moment. In regards to age, so the highest incidence or the peak incidence of ACL injuries in females is between 15 and 19. Okay. Males is 20 to 24. And that 15 to 19 age group is, is sort of a close second. So that is when they are at most risk. And largely, um, when I certainly got involved in the national team, we had a really young uh, average age of when people debuted for the national team. So we, we are, um, players are debuting for the national team at 16, 17 years old. Now, one coach at one point in time misconstrued that I was saying that I didn't think that they should be getting picked. I've absolutely never said that. What I'm saying is we need to support them prior to that to make sure that they are robust enough to be able to withstand the demands of international football. So what does it look like for Australian women's football? So the incidence is greater. So two, depending on what papers you read, is, is largely your chances are a double to four times as, as much if you're a female footballer than if you are not. This is the team from the 2016 uh, Rio Olympics. The round the red circles are they've had one ACL injury and Lydia has had two on the same side so if you think about that group uh, of quite a select group of players 
that's, that's sort of six years of technical constraint that you take out of that group. You take away the year that Sam didn't play um, and didn't, uh, didn't participate in the 2011 uh, Olympic qualifiers and, you know, that's, that's another year why, where she could have been getting better and better. And, you know, whilst everyone talks about Sam's story, she certainly was a gifted athlete from day one but she was lazy. So her ACL injury back then when she was 17 really gave her the opportunity to work her ass off, if you excuse my language, in the gym under some really good supervision for a year. And she came out, and she will admit it 100%, she came out a much better athlete as a result of that. But what I'm saying to all of us is to encourage you to, we want that to happen before that occurs. Because once you have an ACL injury, it's not like you rehab and then you get back and you're scot-free. Sarah's a, you know, a, a very living example of the fact that within 10 to 15 years of that first injury, you will develop some signs of osteoarthritis. So if you have that injury when you're 15 years old, 25 is not old uh, and you've got a long life to live. So it's really important that we can, we can save that first one. So why is it that females are more prone? So we have different anatomy, so the notch, which is the, the um, area in the knee where the ACL passes through, is narrower in females. There is uh, a well-documented hormonal influence, but you, we can't change someone's anatomy and we can't change, or it's very controversial to think about changing someone's hormonal kind of balance. So what we can change, though, is the neuromuscular component, and what that means is the strategies of how we jump, how we land, and how we develop strength. So up until... Um, the end of sort of childhood, males and females will develop the same. And then once we hit puberty, males will go on and they will increase their strength at a more rapid rate than females will tend to plateau. And that's where another really important time when we need to make sure that we can physically support them and improve on that development so that we just don't, they just don't hit a linear strap when we're upping their exposure to football and to sort of high demand sort of activities. So what can we do strategically to try and reduce, reduce these injuries? And so when we talk about injury prevention, largely, as I said before, we don't know when we prevent them. So risk reduction is probably a better term, but there is very good efficacy of programs, as I said, that's been around for a long time that suggests that we can reduce these numbers by up to half. What happens in science and what happens in the real world, as we all know, are two really different things and there are a number of reasons for that. So in regards to our strategy at the FFA, in regards to ACL prevention, it's about advocating for exercise programs um, that have been well proven. There is no point trying to reinvent the wheel because we know that they work, end of story, they work. How our challenge is, is that how do we do that together and how do we do it well because there are lots of barriers to, to doing that. So in regards to um, programs, so Sweden came up with their own um, knee program called the Knee Control which came out before the 11 plus and, and they have it implemented into their coaching curriculum uh, and they have seen a reduction of 65% of um, ACL injuries. The other work, the Swedish um, Football Federation have done a fantastic job in terms of their nationwide implementation but Compliance is a big factor. So that what their studies show is if you're, if you're highly compliant, so if it's performed at least twice a week, then you are much better off than if you, clearly, if you don't do it at all. So compliance is, is important. The 11 plus hopefully is not a new um, phrase for any of you in this room, but again, significant numbers of injuries reduced as a result of that program. But you won't know what, what, what player you have prevented. There is also the 11 plus kids. So in terms of strength and neuromuscular programs, it's really important that they're age appropriate. So, um, and we know that fun and activity is a really important part of um, you know, compliance and keeping participation numbers up. So the 11 plus kids is relatively new compared to the 11 plus. It's been out for a few years. And all these resources are available easily online along with a manual which is a bit daunting for a coach because the manuals are like 80 pages long. So. Um, that's another barrier really in terms of the implementation. But um, we know that they, those programs exist. So the neuromuscular training programs like the 11 plus, netball in this country has now um, brought out a knee program which is based on the 11 plus, hasn't been validated to the, the fortunate thing we have with football is it's played as we know all over the world. So 
we don't need to reinvent that. Netball has to validate their program. AFL have a program that's been validated for community males, but certainly not in females. So we're ahead of the game in that regard, but what we need to do is make sure that we implement them. So we know that we know that they work. We also know that there is more, um, the numbers are better if you introduce it earlier. So once they've gone through puberty, you've kind of almost missed the boat in terms of the efficacy of these programs. So the earlier the better, because often the question I get asked is, well, how early is early enough? Well, in terms of the concept of what exercise is, obviously we have to adapt that depending on their age. So that's where the 11 plus kids is really useful, but certainly the earlier the better. So that if you coach within that sort of 12 to 18 year age group, then absolutely you guys should be using this program. Now, there are barriers that we all know um, to doing that, but really if you think about when that peak incidence is of 15 to 19, getting these programs before that time is absolutely crucial. So as I said, 72% if you can get it introduced into pre and early adolescence. Late adolescence is still really useful. You can still um, reduce the injuries of lower limbs by half. And if you start over the age of 20, then compared to that lower um, age group, it's not as effective. But in saying that, I would still make sure that you don't want to say, yes, you do it and no, you don't, because we cannot predict who will go on to be injured and who won't. So in regards to um, the training programs, we have to consider lots of things. So as long as there's a strength component, there's a plyometric component, there's some agility, there's flexibility and there's balance. So that's what the 11 plus does in a packaged format. Now it's not a one size fits all, there's three levels within that uh, and it certainly can be adapted depending on time constraints. So as I said before, people will age differently. So we know about Chronological age, so someone is 13 years old, but a 13 year old can have the biological maturity um, that might be, you know, might swing over a five year period compared to their peers. So it depends on, you know, where they are at from both of those sense in terms of their chronological age, in terms of their ability to process information, but also physically where they're at in their biological maturity, which will, which may influence what you're doing. But largely those components of it can be adapted to any, any part of that. So as I said before, there are some factors about injury um, that we can't change and they're modifiable and there is non-modifiable. So non-modifiable means they've had a previous injury of an ACL, they've had a previous um, broken leg which has meant they've been in a boot for a long time. They may have a family history of an ACL which puts them at more risk. So if mum or dad or a siblings have one done. But we're not going to say to them, don't you do that program if only do it if mum or dad's had their knee. We want this, this is a really like a vaccine. It needs to be done across the board to get those numbers out. In terms of um, modifiable risk factors, so um, their weight is important. Obviously their physical and aerobic capacity and their fitness is really important. But the two things that largely these programs will that we want you to kind of consider is the neuromuscular control and their tissue resilience. So that means how strong are they, how capable are they? And that's where strength and conditioning and, and the, the programs can be tailored to the individual. So in regards to, you know, how young is too young, how, you know, whatever, what have you, again, I'm not presenting my opinion, but so the IOC, as we know, is, you know, is a pretty um, influential um, sporting um, movement uh, and often what they will do is they'll get some very intelligent people from all over the world together to kind of come up with what's called a consensus statement. So in regards to youth at athletic development, um, this was um, developed, this paper came out in 2016, is that the couple of key recommendations that are really important to note is that early exposure to strength and conditioning is important. Now, often that conjures up you know, images of people lifting heavy in a gym. It doesn't need to mean that. As long as those components that I talked about before, about strength and plyometrics and, and that control, meaning move, good quality movement um, is in there is really important. And it can have an impact in terms of physical performance, but it also has a very real impact in regards to, um, to injury risk, which is, which, is, um, which is great. So we need to be able to identify early um, the individual in regards to what their physical capabilities are and then be able to prescribe a program that's, that's individualised. So like Julie said before, 
you tailor your coaching to the individual. This is like coaching but in a different sense. And I really like before, Julie, how you were bashing them up with the, um, with the, the, the bag because that's actually a really fantastic way to do neuromuscular landing training. So we land differently when you hit in the air. So when you go up for a challenge, one of the three mechanisms of doing an ACL is landing after hitting a ball. So if you ask a, one of your kids to jump just on the spot, or if you do that after they have been, um, they've headed the ball, or if you do that after they've been pushed with a, with the, um, with a tackling bag, their strategy will be different. So we need to teach them to jump and land and be able to hold and withstand their body weight against someone that potentially could be 30 kilos stronger than them and has been doing that for a long time. So there are lots of ways you can introduce that that doesn't have to be boring and doesn't have to be like, oh God, here we go, 11 plus, it's happening again. So in regards to implementation, that's our big challenge because we really, we know it works, but there are lots of barriers and time I know with coaches is the big thing. So, you know, often it's like, well, it takes 15 minutes at the start of the program. We just don't have that time because we might see these kids once a week and I want to work on their football. So as I said before, compliance is crucial. So in regards to the 11 plus, there's the running component at the start. The middle section is the strength and the movement quality. So that has been shown recently in sub-elite groups uh, and some Australian researchers have done that. So Matt Whalen in, in Wollongong is a large part of that, um, is that you can do that component at the end of training. Okay, so it doesn't have to be done before training because often that's, that's a large barrier to the implementation. It can also be done at home. The reality is if they do it at home or not, um, but it doesn't have to all be done in one chunk. Okay, the other important thing in regards to imp implementation is that you can't just sort of pick and choose because they like that exercise, they don't like that one. We don't know which one works, but we know together as a group that they work. Okay. So, um, as I said, at community level, it's really important that it's done. Largely, as I said, it can be done before or after training. This is the strength in the movement component and there is no increased injury risk. So um, often another question I get asked a lot is with Nordics is can you do that at the start of the training? Yes, you can, but you can also do it at the end of training. And largely girls potentially struggle with that exercise. So there are ways around that that you can make that useful for them. In regards to elite, it shouldn't replace a gym program, um, but those components and those um, those movement qualities are the same. They're just replicated depending on the level of, of application. So, um, you know, it will become more advanced um, as they go through. So, as I said, really good examples of nationwide implementation is the Norwegians. And as I said, in, in New Zealand, they have a, a, a fantastic system. Largely, it's differently funded from a uh, insurance point of view. Everyone that gets injured in New Zealand is covered under the ACC, so it's easier to be able to have some nationwide implementation. So we have some barriers here, but as I said, I don't think that we can um, that we should you know just give up. In regards to doing it at home, a good app that I would encourage you to use and get your players to download is what's called Get Set, which is being developed by the IOC and by the Oslo Sports Trauma Research Centre. It's free. Um, there is different um, sports on there, but the football component is the 11 plus. So there is videos on there. They can get some good instruction at home. Um, it's easily accessible. So, you know, in regards to trying to get that movement and that strength component happening, they can do that at home and they can certainly do that with some feedback of the mirror and there's some good um, verbal cues that are on that video. So as I said, I think really um, it's almost like a plea, which sounds really sad, but together we absolutely can do this, but it won't work if people don't know about it. It won't work if we decide that it's not important um, and it won't work if we don't do it properly and if you kind of do it for a bit and then you don't keep doing it. So the compliance and the fidelity is where we have our real challenge and where I would encourage all of you to try and stick with it um, for as long as you can because ultimately we want to protect that group of players. So if you think of that, that players in that group there, um, you know, Elise Kellon Knight, decent. Uh, Sam Kerr, decent. They can come back from a, um, an ACL injury. Lydia Williams, you know, I think she's handy. So, you know, we want to make sure that we get these players back on the pitch. Um, and I won't go on to that, that's about loads. So thank you very much for your time. You kept your time. You did, well done. Um, do, do we have a quick question for Kate? It's weird calling you that. I'm busy. Oh, busy. <laughs> Thanks. Anyone? Yes, Maria. Has research been done around the relationship between um, 
gymnastics in early childhood and um, because what you're describing there is day in, day out. Yep. For gym, for gymnasts. Correct. Yep. Yep. So, gym, I mean, it's not that gymnasts aren't averse to ACL injury, um, they certainly are. And there's a, you know, male and female in the Australian team at the moment that have. But um, absolutely, gymnastics is a great way of learning how to tumble and jump and land and all those things. So, absolutely. Uh, and it's also, you know, if you are rehabbing someone, gymnastics is a great way to do that because it exposes them to lots of different things. So I absolutely would love every kid to do gymnastics at school. The reality is these programs should be a part of our school curriculum. Um, and if we are serious about trying to get that number down, which New Zealand are and Sweden are and Nor Norway are, then it, it'll be in schools. But largely now for us, we've got to worry about our own patch, which is, um, which is footballers. So we're currently lobbying the government and, and, and so forth to try and get some more programs happening. But I mean, as we all know, you know, we need to kind of um, advocate and then have the science behind it and then and put a good case forward of which that, you know, we can replicate what's happening around the world. But good question, yeah. Thank you very much, Beersy. Um, can we all give Beersy a warm round of applause? <laughs>